Hello, everyone. In this meeting, we have four students' lectures. Um, so without any delay, let's move to the first one by Ron. Ron, the stage is yours. Thanks, Mikhail. All right, so today I'm going to talk about the paper, Diffusion Posterior Sampling for General Noisy Universe Problems. It's a paper from ICLR 2023 from a team from KAIST and Korea and Los Alamos. And uh, breaking the title, you understand that we're going to talk about inverse problems, specifically general and noisy. So this implies uh, also nonlinear problems. And we're going to solve it using diffusion and specifically the, the method or the approach we already talked about, posterior sample. One of the approaches to use diffusion models to solve inverse problems. Now, I'll do a quick recap on what we talked about uh, on the inverse problem setting. So. When we talked about inverse problems, usually we have some x, right? And it goes a transformation, we measure a y. Usually it implies that we have a degradation, so we have a loss of information, and we want to recover uh, from this y an estimate of x, so we accept. And we've seen many different problems, uh, for instance, inpatient or the percentage of the pixel zone, or MF that covers the image. Here you can also see that the the measurement is not is not clean. We have noise on the on the mask. Uh, there's Gaussian blur, so some convolution in the kernel with the kernel motion blur, which different different kind of uh, blur, like an integration over a motion of the kernel. Um, super resolution, so we have a low resolution image. We want to recover high detail speech or high resolution feature, uh, features of the original image, and all of these are linear. Right. And these are also nonlinear problems. For instance, phasal travel. So phasal travel is um, a famous problem in signal processing where we measure a, we want to recover the object from the measurement of the magnitude of its fluoretal form. So phaseless measurement. So it's a pretty hard problem and also non-nonlinear. Uh, we can think about different kinds of blows that don't follow this uh, convolution, so they are not linear. And um, going a bit more um, formal and trying to, to formalize the problem, what we'll consider in this in our case is the following measurement or a forward model uh, given uh, by y equals uh, ax, so some operator operating on you know, x, our desired or, uh, or the signal of interest, uh, plus some noise. So a can be uh, linear or nonlinear, and m is some additive noise. Um, it's uh, noisy and non-linear. And I note that the paper also discussed uh, transformers. So um, I'm not going to talk about the details of, of this case. If you're interested, it's in the paper. Uh, but I'm just uh, pointing it out because in this case, it's not additive noise. So it will be single dependent noise, so slightly different forward model. Okay? Now, how, how does this relate to diffusion? So I remind you that we discussed that because we have a degradation of, of information or a loss of information because of the degradation, we have a multitude of um, possible solutions to this problem. And we want to try and sample from a P of X given Y, okay? So given our measurement, we want to uh, sample some uh, high perceptual or good quality samples from this or possible solutions to this problem. And we know that from diffusion, we can do that. So if you go, if we we'll use the diffusion as a sample by, change, by changing P of X to P of X conditions and Y, we can sample from this distribution, right? So uh, looking at the condition score fun function by base, we got the following, right? So we already saw this in, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, so the, this term is the score function. And this term is a, is a bit tricky, all right? And we need to, to try to see how to tackle it. Um, and we saw different approaches. Uh, I just remind you, like, we saw SNPs, DDRM, PyGDM. Um, PyGDM is interesting because it's highly related to uh, this paper. It, in fact, it was published in the same conference, and I'll touch on it a bit later. But let's see what uh, DPS tries to do. So. Mm -hmm. You can continue. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, back to this slide. So the, the approach, the, our problem is that 
the, this quantity the distribution by uh, the probability of y given xt is not tractable. There isn't a direct analytical connection between xt and y. We can look at it uh, to this graph where given uh, x0, uh, there is an analytical connection to y given by the measurement uh, measurement model, right? So if this is, for instance, our noise is Gaussian, it's, it's easy to compute this uh, distribution or, and write it out. The same for um, the probability of xt given x0. There is a connection to the diffusion process, these layers of noise that we can compute this probability. But the problem is that, for instance, there isn't a connection uh, between uh, the probability of x0 given xt. Um, there isn't a direct one. We saw how to overcome it when we talked about the, the diffusion process and the various algorithms. Uh, but there isn't, a, again, there isn't a connection between uh, this y and xt, okay? Now, what the, the paper suggests to, to do is to approximate the above by the following. So replacing xt with x0 hat. So this is the posterior mean, all right? Now, we need to answer two questions regarding this. So first, why is this helpful? And second, why is this reasonable? Why can we do this approximation? And the reason this is helpful is because um, if we have this posterior mean, this AST with the posterior mean, we can compute this probability analytically by the measurement model, right? So this is tractable, this, uh, this gradient, this uh, gradient of the log that we need to, to compute. We can argue if this is strictly accurate or how accurate it is because technically x, the posterior mean depends on xt, so it's not really uh, x0, but as a plug-in estimate, this, this, is, this is reasonable. And the second thing is the, the posterior mean, uh, we have a formula for it, we know how to calculate it, using this, um, this equation that, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we got it from Tweedy's formula, and we can approximate it using the score function, right? So we're taking this value uh, below of the problem to the score function. So this is helpful. Now, why is this reasonable? Okay. So we can notice that if we marginalize over x0, so we write this expression um, and expanding on x0, uh, we already saw. Uh, when we talked about PyGDM that in fact we can remove here xt because the probability of y given x0 and xt really depends on uh, only on x0. So this is the clean version and we can compute it using the for instance, the, prob the probability, the, sorry, the forward model. So we don't really need xt, which is the, the graded noisy version. Now, one way to interpret this integral is to uh, is to look at it as an expectance, right? So I can write it in the following form. I just computed the expectant, expectant value uh, under this distribution of x0. Now, if I tie it into the approximation that we, we suggest, uh, so this is, this is what we just developed, this is the approximation, and I write it explicitly uh, with the term from the uh, posterior mean, and we get the following. Now, when we write it in this fashion, there is some more interesting um, observation to be made that we, here we have an outer expectant, expectance value. And uh, under the approximation, we kind of push the, the uh, expectancy to an inner, inner one only on x0. This has a familiar flavor, which should remind us something like of Jensen inequality, right? And uh, indeed, in the paper, what they show, um, they show something similar using Jensen gap. So for some uh, uh, and variable and f some function, uh, the Jensen gap is defined as the following uh, property. So it's the difference between taking expectance on f of x minus uh, f over the expectance on x, all right? In, and in our case, this is x and uh, f. Now, what we show for the measurement model with Gaussian noise is that this is bounded, all right? And we have here a three, a three factors to this bound. So the first one is this, uh, this term that really depends on the measurement noise. Now, you can notice that if the noise is very, very high, so the noise in, in our signal is Y, 
then this bound is very tight. So this goes to zero, which at least um, in, intuitively to me, it makes sense because in this case, the, the noise is very, very high. Um, we have a, a noise dominant measurement, right? So it doesn't really matter if I use XT or the posterior. I mean, in that case, we are noise dominant and this will di dictate the probability. The other two terms, and uh, first one is, is a, a form of uh, operator norm where we just take the maximum of the change in, in our uh, nonlinear or our measurement uh, operator. Um, and the second one is a form of uh, distortion of our denoiser. Uh, the so they don't actually mention this explicitly in the paper, but if you look at it, uh, this really uh, is a form of basically an MMC of the denoiser because the uh, our posterior mean is given to us by the, the score function, so it, a denoiser, and we look at how different it is from uh, over all the po uh, possible x zeros given xt. All right. Now, if we have a very good denoiser, which is expected, then we will also have a very tight bound, which is great. And I'll, I'll just say that um, we, we talked about the uh, distortion uh, uh, perception trade-off, right? Um, it doesn't really contradict it because here we are only talking about the, uh, the denoiser. So we can expect that if our denoiser is good, it will have a low distortion, but the overall diffusion algorithm can have a good perceptual quality and it uh, lives side by side. Right, so this is a very nice result that really justifies, in a way, the, the approximation that they suggest. And going to the algorithm, it's it's very um, straightforward how to implement it. So I show you uh, two variants of the algorithm for Gaussian noise and a Poisson noise. Again, for the Gaussian for the Poisson uh, case, please refer to uh, the paper for the details. Uh, but basically, but what they did is they took um, uh, the DDPM algorithm pretty much uh, uh, until line six. And then they added in line seven, the variation that um, adds this guide, guided term, which is basically just the, the gradient of the log of the probability function of Y given uh, the posterior mean. All right, so this is explicitly this term uh, written analytically. Um, you can also note that there is a, another hyperparameter here, which is basically the, the gradient step. And they don't give ex directly um, explanation to this uh, replacement. So if you follow the derivation, um, here you should have basically one over the, uh, the sigma y, so the, the measurement noise, uh, which comes directly from the, uh, the Gaussian probability term. Right, the, the the power of the of the exponent, and um, they replace it with just a hyperparameter. My assumption is that it gives more uh, flexibility, uh, and it, and in this way you don't really need to uh, estimate the uh, the noise in the signal. Um, yeah. So just a, a minor detail. Now moving to to results. Uh, here we have results of uh, DPS comparing uh, on the super resolution task. Uh, they compare themselves to DDRM. So this is the extension of uh, SNPs, a uh, 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 paper by uh, Mickey Steam. And they saw they, we see some good results uh, from, their, uh, uh, from their method. I think slightly more, uh, perhaps more features are recovered. Um, they also saw, they, they also give some results on a uh, Gaussian blur and motion blur. Uh, here they compare to, or at least they give sa samples from a uh, plug and play ADMM. So this is a method that relies on deep learning. I think it's curious that they don't show you results with DDRM, uh, which should also, I think, which I think is better and shows, uh, which is more state of the art. Um, for me, it's a bit lacking that we don't uh, we don't see also samples from this uh, from this method. Uh, looking overall. Uh, on the results of the table, we, we see that DPS over the linear problems gives very good results. Um, you can see here in, in what I mentioned before in, in the previous slide that indeed uh, they don't really, they, they are a bit, um, I mean, the results are pretty much the same for DDRM, I would argue. I mean, it looks uh, almost identical. Um, moving on to the nonlinear problems, which is really the hallmark of this work that really gives. Uh, the framework 
uh, for uh, solving nonlinear problems. Uh, on the phasor trivial task, uh, which again, it, we have a measurement of the magnitude of the Fourier transform of an object, and we want to recover this object. Um, uh, we see very good results. Okay, so they compose to various uh, iterative algorithms. Uh, I think again, it's not um, as um, as fair because these algorithms are not deep learning based. They are iterative and a bit old, uh, but nonetheless, because I think it, it's one of the first diffusion based uh, algorithms to uh, work on uh, nonlinear problems, perhaps this is fair as there isn't really a baseline. Uh, but they show very good results if you look at the, the recovery. Um, the same for the non-uniform uh, uh, deep learning. The, the details of this uh, deep learning is a bit, of this blur uh, function is a bit intricate. Um, I won't go over it, but if you're interested, it's, it, you can find it in the appendix of the paper, right? But they show again, very good results. Um, Let's say I want to conclude by discussing the differences between a DPS and a PyGDM. Uh, so I just remind you that the, the basic, um, the fundamental quantity that we kind of hinged on uh, in the approximation and analysis is this uh, marginalization over uh, X0. Now, um, we in fact, uh, when Mickey uh, elaborated on a PyGDM in the previous lecture, in fact, he, he also mentioned DPS. They are very closely related, right? Through this, this uh, um, analysis. Now, in this analysis, PyGDM approximates uh, this quantity as the Gaussian with uh, uh, the posterior mean as the mean and some variance, uh, depending on the data and the, um, and the denoiser. Well, DPS can be seen as an approximation that takes this quantity as a delta function around the, uh, the posterior mean. Okay, so this is really the, the difference, but I think the, the most sub, substantial um, change comes from the derivation of the algorithm. So PyGDM doesn't require differentiability, all right, as we, we've seen in the algorithm, in this algorithm, but it does require to define a, a pseudo inverse of the of A, right? For linear tasks, this is reasonable, but for nonlinear tasks, this is tricky, and it's not that trivial to do it for any nonlinear problem. While DPS doesn't require this, but it does require differentiability due to this term that is added to the algorithm, okay? This term, in fact, actually also incurs some extra computational cost because we need to do a back propagation to the network uh, on this term, all right? And, and the second thing is that for nonlinear PyGDM, it assumes no noise in Y. I think it ties a bit to this, to this uh, point before that we need to define this um, Tether inverse of A in the nonlinear case, which is kind of tricky. Now, looking at the comparison, um, we can see that the results of, are pretty comparable, um, but PyGDM is much, much faster. And they kind of, in, in a way, perhaps post a bit about it. And we can see that we get roughly the same perceptual quality results at, for PyGDM at uh, 100 steps. and for DPS at around 1,000, okay? So a factor of 10. Uh, I think it's it's more of a technical thing rather than a fundamental one because uh, PyGDM uses DDIM versus a DPS that uses D DDPM, which is slower, okay? Although DPS does use, uh, do, do use um, uh, or requires to do uh, this gradient step, which can be costly computationally. Uh, looking at the comparison, we can see that the results are very comparable, but again, um, PyGDM is much faster, and this is for the super resolution. Note also that um, this is only a linear case, which, which I think is interesting because uh, DPS, I think, really the, its strength comes from the nonlinear case because it gives a general way to uh, to work with nonlinear functions that only requires differentiability. Okay. Um, okay, so. In interest uh, of time, in, in goddess with Mickey, uh, I won't really go over the uh, uh, the details of the uh, of my extension to this work. Uh, but if anyone is interested, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm basically just uh, I, I'm going to give it in uh, one line that I'm going to take this work to a problem in my research that deals with uh, an inverse problems in a quantum mechanic uh, in the quantum mechanic world, so a physics uh, problem. 
Um, so feel free to reach out if it's of interest to you. And, and just to summarize, so we talked about the method for procedural sampling using diffusion models for uh, inverse problems. Hinges on the support of summation. Okay, replacing py given xt with py on the posterior mean, condition on the posterior mean. It gives a very nice uh, quantification of this, or justifies the, uh, the approximation theoretically using uh, this uh, uh, Jensen gap and bounding it, all right? And um, really the strength is that it, it is able to solve noisy and nonlinear uh, problems in general form. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, Mohanad, the stage is yours. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about the paper for uh, high resolution synthesis uh, with latent diffusion models. Uh, this work was done by a team from uh, Munich University in 2022. Um, it was an, it, it's not a very mathematical paper. It should be an easy walk for you guys, I hope. Uh, but it was really a breakthrough in the field. Um, so the authors uh, start off by reintroducing us to the diffusion models that we know. We know that uh, uh, there have been uh, some, uh, uh, they have showed some state of the art results in various tasks, such as uh, conditional image synthesis and super resolution. However, these models, as we know, have uh, some downsides to them. Uh, for example, their iterative training and their sequential evaluation. Um, but most importantly, which is the point that uh, uh, authors have focused on in the paper, these models operate in a huge pixel, pixel space. Uh, and the consequences of these downsides is uh, basically, obviously we have, uh, they are very expensive uh, to train and use in time and memory. Um, they are not very, uh, the resources to develop these models are not accessible to a large fraction of the field. And this will also leave a huge carbon footprint. So how did the, uh, so uh, what was the motive uh, of the authors here exactly? So uh, a result that they have showed uh, and we know is that most of the bits in the image actually correspond to some undetectable details in the image. So if we see here in the diagram on, on the right, um, uh, uh, in high resolution, we actually get a, a low effect in the uh, uh, distortion. So what the idea is here, it's very simple. We uh, All we need to do, we need to find a perceptually equivalent space that uh, we will work with in our model, such that we don't actually uh, impair or harm the performance and keep efficient training and even faster sampling as well. So the learning was divided into two stages here. We have perceptual co compression in which we uh, remove these imperceptible uh, or undetectable details. And after that, we have semantical compression in which we actually learn the composition and the distribution of the data itself. Uh, so how do we do this? How do we, how do we get to this perceptually equivalent space? The method that the authors used uh, used in their model, uh, they employed an autoencoder model. So uh, given an RGB image, we use an autoencoder uh, such that the encoder will compress compress the, the input into its latent re representation. And after we are done with the diffusion process, we will reconstruct the result uh, back into pixel space from, from this latent space. So the, so the autoencoder actually learns this perceptually equivalent space that we operate in. Uh, in, the, in the paper itself, the autoencoder was trained separately. Uh, this has the advantage of it being reusable. So uh, the same autoencoder was used for multiple uh, models with uh, different tasks. Additionally, the authors have also employed a conditional uh, conditioning mechanism. Uh, this technique actually allows us to control the synthesis process. So 
they have employed this conditioning uh, uh, mechanism to uh, employ uh, synthesis using text to image, uh, also audio to image, and even map to image, and so on. Uh, so this uh, was introduced into the model to actually uh, have a more flexible results uh, as well. And finally, we have the actual block that describes the diffusion process. So as we can see, given the latent vector that we already employed the encoder on, it goes through the diffusion process and we get a noisy vector on the other side. And in the reverse diffusion step, uh, we will embed the condition that we employed and uh, uh, feed it into our uh, neural backbone that will uh, do the diffusion process iteratively. Um, so uh, uh, if we focus uh, a little bit on this, uh, uh, on the denoiser itself, uh, it, actually, it actually employs cross attention uh, uh, for the condition that we added, and it is uh, designed as a unit, uh, as a whole. Um, and if we go back a little bit to our uh, objective, we see that it's not uh, 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 very hard to see uh, how the object it, uh, itself is not far from the loss for the standard diffusion model. So uh, what we are working with here is we are looking for the expectation on some uh, uh, encoded input with some condition. And our uh, uh, denoiser here actually works with the latent uh, a noisy image along with some embedded condition with it. So zooming out into the full picture, uh, this is the whole model. We have uh, an encoder decoder that transfers us into the uh, uh, latent space. Uh, we have uh, the uh, conditional uh, uh, conditioner here that uh, employs some uh, condition to feed into the diffusion process as well. It can be text, it can be audio, it can be uh, whatever. And uh, the diffusion process itself also uh, adds this cross attention uh, to uh, control the condition that uh, uh, it was added uh, to. And after we uh, and after we are done with the diffusion, we use the decoder to go back into the pixel space that we started off with. So obviously we can see here that since we are working in latent space, which is uh, 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 in lower dimension of the original uh, space that we started off with, this can uh, exceptionally um, help us in, uh, uh, in our performance uh, and uh, uh, in the expenses of our model itself. So if we go to some experiments that were done in the paper, um, uh, there were four main experiments in the paper. Here are some data sets used. Uh, they use data sets su such as Celeb A, um, uh, ImageNet, and LSUN, and so on. Uh, but before we actually go into the experiments, um, uh, we need to know which model we need to operate with. So uh, to to tackle this, the authors uh, have done some tests to see which model performs uh, more well, let's say. Um, so uh, giving some different downsampling factors to different models, we can see here that, for example, uh, um, uh, LDM1 is the standard diffusion model uh, with no downsampling at all, LDM2 with downsampling factor two and so on. And in these diagrams here, we see that uh, LDM4 and 8 uh, performed uh, the best in terms of FID score and also in terms of inception score. The authors also tested inference speed uh, in contrast to sampling quality uh, with both ImageNet and Celebe. And we can also see here that uh, LDM4 and 8 are the most uh, stable models, let's say, in both uh, in both uh, uh, data sets. So the first experiment that was done is image generation without any conditioning at all. Um, 
we see here that LDM4 actually achieved a new state of the art result for FID score uh, on the CELEB-A data set. Uh, also LDM4 and 8 outperformed GANs uh, in some precision and, uh, and recall measurements uh, uh, as well. However, uh, style GAN and projected GANs outperformed the, the model in the LSUN uh, data sets. Uh, the next experiment that was done is uh, conditioning the diffusion process with uh, text to image synthesis. Um, so here as well, LDM8 has achieved uh, the best inception score compared to some autoregressive models uh, and GAN models. This is due to uh, it being trained with uh, uh, the callback uh, uh, Leibler uh, regularization uh, so that the latent space itself uh, has actually low variance and also bird organizer was used for for language processing so if we see here some images the trains for example on the top row are seen in the same position uh, for the segmentation task also the vases and uh, uh, here these street signs uh, have the same or similar um uh, description on them uh, according to the input text here. And for super resolution, uh, LDMSR actually outperformed SR3, uh, which was the state of the art at the time in FID. However, SR3 has a better uh, IS score. So uh, if we see here, for example, in the vehicle or LDMSR, it has. Um, uh, 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 sorry, for SR3, it has more details in the image, um, uh, which are not existing in the LDMSR. So you can objectively uh, uh, actually use LDMSR for this task, but maybe uh, 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 some reconsideration should be done for, for it as well. And for, uh, for inpainting, um, four models were uh, executed on the standard diffusion model, LDM1, and also LDM4 with uh, uh, KL rig with attention. Also, uh, uh, vector quantization was employed with and without attention. And LDM4 uh, has actually performed at least 2.7 times faster uh, and has a better FID score as well than the stadium diffusion. Um, so for example, in these images here, we can see the results from the uh, latent diffusion model. Um, some experiments that were not in the paper that I have done personally. So uh, uh, I used LDM8 with KL rig, which was the best one for this task as seen before. Um, this is the, the script used uh, for this task. Uh, so some parameters, you can uh, insert your prompt, uh, the image style, and uh, here we have H and W for dimensions. Uh, and some interesting parameters is DDIM uh, ETA, which is for the diversity of the image. You have scale, which is for the quality of the image, and DDIM steps, which is for the sampling speed itself. Um, there actually exists some uh, uh, um, uh, give and take between these parameters here. So uh, the model actually uses uh, this classifier um, uh, S here uh, uh, describes the scale. So we can see that if you increase the scale, you actually um, uh, have a lower diversity uh, in the image itself. So here are some outputs that I got. So a uh, dog put in out of fire. We can see that for S, uh, which is the scale, uh, which is higher than other images, you can see that it has more quality to it here, for example. Uh, as well for a person crossing a busy intersection, for example, here in the first image with the lowest, um, there is no sense of direction in the image. Also in here in the second image, whereas for a highest, um, you can see that it has uh, uh, better quality to it. And also some cows, for example, if you, if you love cows. 
So what are, the, what are some key takeaways from this paper? Well, the authors have introduced us to the latent diffusion models, which have shown impressive results in various tasks. Um, uh, it has also shown how to work in latent space with diffusion models uh, and uh, actually uh, allow the model to work with more complex patterns. Also, they have used this conditioning mechanism, which allows, uh, allows uh, this flexibility to control the model's output uh, as well. And um, uh, so, uh, uh, the, main, the main thing here is that these models actually are the predecessors to stable diffusion, uh, which the next uh, presenters will talk about more um, uh, in the next hour. So what are also some future directions to this paper? Um, we can see, uh, as we have shown before, for super resolution, for example, um, the score that it got in the IS measurement was not very good. So maybe for more uh, uh, tasks that require more uh, fine grade grained, uh, uh, attention from the user, uh, these models do not perform very well. So we can. Uh, maybe improve on that. Another thing is maybe we can develop some ev evaluation metrics uh, to help us understand more how these models operate in this latent space and it, it explore explore this semantic meanings uh, of these spaces. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? I have a question. So how sure. did they solve two inverse problems in painting and super resolution? Um, how do you do it when you are working in the latent space? So in which the, uh, in, in which experiment are you, uh, are you talking the, about the same experiment or two different experiments? The experiment on super resolution and the experiment on mm -hmm. painting are two inverse problems where they are using this, this uh, scheme and I'm mm -hmm. wondering how they are solving inverse problems. Um, so uh, the the uh, backbone of the network itself, the denoiser, does not actually differ more uh, from uh, standard diffusion models. So um, uh, uh, as we have seen in the objective, it's not really different from uh, the standard model uh, that was employed um, so the same way that the standard uh, models uh, solve these problems, problems uh, as well. So what does it mean? The, the epsilon that we have in the, the latent diffusion model works in mm -hmm. the latent space. So basically it gets a noisy latent vector and cleans it up. If I want to solve a super resolution problem, why do I do? I, I inject the latent of the low resolution image so uh, here, all, all of the diffusion process is done in latent space. So uh -huh. uh, as you can see here, when we get the latent vector, the noise added is actually done uh, uh, in the latent sta uh, space sure. itself. Sure. So how do you squeeze in now the knowledge about the low resolution image in super resolution, for example? Do you, put, how do you do, squeeze? How do you mm -hmm. use the low resolution image in super resolution? Do you pass it through the encoder and then just feed it to the denoiser? Uh, you mean uh, uh, to add the noise uh, to the latent vector? No, yeah. never mind. Uh, again, can you repeat just to understand? No, no, no. Let's um, Other questions, please. OK. <clears throat> OK, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Let's take. Uh... Okay, we proceed with Ido and Tomer. Ido and Tomer, the stage is yours. Thank you. So we're Ido and Tomer, and today we'll be presenting the paper and images worth one blog. So let's start with a bit of motivation. We talked a lot in discourse how text to image models show amazing abilities in generating images. But what if we want to generate an image with some specific concept? For example, a mug that we got a statue that we bought, or maybe just a grumpy cat. So let's use this cat as an example and try to generate some more images of this specific cat using text-to-image models. So we started with DALA-E2, 
And we started with a, prompt, a grumpy cat with white fur and brown color around the eyes. We can see that we got some cats, but these are definitely not our cat. So we further refined the prompt. Now it's a grumpy Burman looking cat whose fur is mostly white with brown fur around the eyes. And we got, we got closer, but it's not our cat. But you know what, let's say that it is close enough. And now I want to use some more complicated prompt. I want to make my cat sitting on the beach. So I just added sitting on the beach to the end of the prompt. And we got some cats on the beach, but this is definitely not the cat that we started with. So I hope I convinced you that despite the amazing abilities, current text to image models struggle to generate specific concepts. And one of the main issues is that it's quite hard to describe some specific unique concept with fine details that the model might have never even seen before. So in this talk, we're going to discuss how we can leverage pre-trained text to image models to generate unique concepts. And there are many works in this personalization field. And the settings we're working with is that first we have access to a few images that represent the concept, about five images. And we're not going to further train or find the model. So all the weights of the text to image model are frozen. And the way we're going to do it is textual inversion. So text to image models take some known prompt and try to generate the image that fits the prompt best. But textual inversion is the exact opposite. We have some known image and we want to find or to learn the text that best describes the image in the sense that if I take, take this text and test it to my text to image model, it will generate my image. So some appetizers before we dive into the technical details. We want to start with some images of a concept or an object. We want to learn the text that best describes it for the model. And then we can plug this text into different prompts and generate new images that are more similar to the images that we started with. So for example, we will be able to use uh, the text that we learn and make this cat happy. And we got a cat that looks much better um, regarding the alignment with the input images. We can make the cat sitting swimming in the ocean. We can make her sitting on the beach. And now let's dive into the technical details of the method. Thank you, Ido. Um, so just a quick reminder about latent diffusion models. Uh, we have an image. Uh, we pass it through an encoder to get it uh, to, the, uh, to have a latent representation of it. Uh, and then we can continue with the diffusion process just uh, in the latent space. Um, okay, so something to notice here, uh, as we already heard, is that we condition it, uh, condition the denoising uh, with the key and value. And how does this help us? We can, uh, uh, well, this allows us to add a condition that is based on image or text or any other form. And we would like to condition it on text. So how would we encode our text so we can provide it uh, to the network? So we would like to have some text encoder, which would uh, take a prompt, which is a sequence uh, of uh, words and generate one embedding, which would represent it. Okay, so how do we do that? We first, uh, uh, we tokenize each word in this uh, sequence uh, and each, uh, each word gets a number. And then we pass this to an embedding lookup, which is a, a dictionary that maps from um, these uh, numbers to an embedding. So each word gets an embedding, and then we pass all of these embedding to a transformer encoder, which combines uh, all of them to uh, one embedding, which represents our prompt. Okay, um, and now let's look at the paper and now uh, they do the textual inversion. So what are they actually trying to do here? So given a few images of uh, some object or a concept, here you can see a statue of a cat. Uh, we would like to associate um, these images, uh, this, this object or concept with a special word. Okay, and here it's uh, denoted uh, as S uh, star. And uh, this way we can write a new phrase which, would, uh, which includes this uh, special word and uh, we would be able to condition our latent diffusion model with that phrase. So how do they do that? Um, so on one hand, we have a text, encode, a text encoder, as I just explained. 
And then what happens is that uh, the, in, the, the encoder gets a prompt, which includes this special word. This, spe this prompt passes to, through the tokenizer, and the tokenizer tokenizes this special word with a special token. Then when we pass it uh, to the embedding lookup, um, the embedding lookup creates a, a new embedding um, um, for that uh, a special token. Uh, and then we can just pass it through the text uh, transformer uh, to get the conditioning. But something uh, uh, to note here is that the model also gets an initialization word. And uh, with that uh, word, we can initialize the embedding of the special word. So here, for example, we have a, cat, a statue of a cat. So the initialization word might be just cat. And uh, with that, we initialize the embedding. OK. And uh, on the other hand, on the other side, we have uh, the uh, generator, which is just the latent diffusion model, which we pass uh, the conditioning to. Um, so what is our goal in this uh, model? The goal is to successfully reconstruct the images. And this way, uh, find the embedding of the special world. OK, so again, how, how do they do that? And um, so each image is passed through the encoder to get a latent representation of it. And then each uh, latent representation is noised to some random time. And we take each of those noise latents and uh, denoise them uh, to one step before. So like from time t to time t minus one. And that is the reconstruction. And uh, how does this old training process uh, looks like? So at each step, they sample a random pair of a sentence and an image. A sentence is taken from a predetermined list. Um, as you can see on the side. So we just take two random pairs of a sequence and images that we already have. And uh, also, I would like to mention that all of the weights are frozen except for the embedding of the special world. And we pass it through the, to, through the network. And, uh, uh, and then with uh, the loss of the reconstruction uh, of the lat latent, as, uh, as just explained, we can propagate back the gradient uh, to optimize for the embedding of the special world. And uh, this is possible because the whole path is uh, differentiable. And this is how we can learn the representation uh, of the world and use it um, for other sentences. So now we'll see some results. Um, so can we generate images that are similar to the in input image? Uh, to the input images. So uh, as we can see, uh, we get very similar results, especially if we look uh, uh, here on the left uh, at uh, the mug, uh, we can see that the details are preserved. Uh, but can uh, other methods uh, get, uh, get uh, such results? So with that, when we condition DALI2 on, uh, on an image, we see that the results are fairly similar. But when looking uh, on the mug, for example, we see that the details are not preserved and we get a different mug. And there are many more applications. So applications, so one uh, other application is the text guidance synthesis, where we get a bunch of input images and we provide the, a, a different a, a text conditioning that includes the special word. So for example, a watercolor painting of a star in a branch. So we get an image with, the, with this a same object or a maybe style transfer um, in which we get a bunch of images with uh, the same style, the same concept. And, and we learn this concept implicitly. So when we write the prompt, we can write the streets of uh, Paris in the style of a star. So this style is learned uh, implicitly. And uh, one last uh, type of result is a composition generation where we can learn a few words so here we learn uh, two words, one for a, uh, for a clock and one for a cat. And we can create a new phrase which combines these two words or many other words uh, that we learn. And uh, now we'll pass uh, back to Ido. OK, thank you, Tomer. So as Tomer showed, the method can learn pretty good 
um, complicated concepts and generate really, really nice images, but it, do, it still has some limitations. So as the shapes and the concepts are more complex, the method will struggle and the quality of the generated images will not always be that great. The optimization times are very, very long because the path from the front to the generated image in the model is quite large, is quite long. And one last thing is that the authors noticed that the more images we have for training, actually the worse our performance will get. And we can see that in this figure where the y-axis is the image similarity, where we measure how well the generated images aligns with the input images that we had. And the x-axis is the text similarity that measures how well the generated images aligns with the prompt that we provided the model. And both of those these similarity measurements are measured in clip space. Um, so we can see that when we have few images, we get nice image similarity and also good text similarity. But when we add more and more images, the image similarity does not improve significantly, but the text similarity actually really degrades, meaning that when we try to generate images with some prompts, the generated images will not align very well with the text and the quality of the images will not be that great. And the authors point out that they saw that when we have many images, the resulted uh, optimized embeddings really reside further from the real world distribution of valid uh, embeddings. So the embeddings just become invalid in the actual space. So now, once we have a good sense of the, of the paper and the limitations, we want to talk about some research directions we want to explore in the project. So we have two main uh, research questions that we uh, put to ourselves. So the first one is, how does the choice of the reconstruction loss, which is the loss of the training of the diffusion model that we saw in the previous lecture as well, affect the performance? And we could divide it into two parts. The first one is that the different input images have different backgrounds. And we also reconstruct the background and that might uh, affect the, uh, the optimization quite hardly. And the second thing that even if we didn't have different backgrounds, the same object can look very different in the RGB space because it can be in different poses and can be looked at from different viewpoints. And the second question is how we can keep the optimized embeddings in the value distribution. So let's dive into those questions more deeply. So the first one was the reconstruction loss. And our hypothesis is that the input images might be quite far in the RGB space and in the latent space. And we're working with stable diffusion. And as, Mick, uh, as Mickey said in one of the last lectures, the latent vectors in stable diffusion can be seen as latent images. And because specifically the um, VAE in stable diffusion is VQVE, which is a convolutional network, there is a connection between the spatial layout of the RGB images and the spatial layout of the latent images. So we fear that the effectiveness of the reconstruction loss is limited. We can see three examples of the cat images here. And we can see that first, we have completely different backgrounds. And second, the cats themselves, the statues, look very different because they are at different poses and we look at them from different viewpoints. So we want to tackle that um, by two things. So first we want to tackle the background. And for that, we want to use some segmentation model to separate the background from the object. And then we want to create some weighted uh, reconstruction loss using some weighting matrix that we will create using the segmentation map. And the goal is to ignore the background or to at least give it like a very, very low weighting in the reconstruction loss. So since we have this connection in the RGB space and the latent space, we can use um, the segmentation map and map this weighting map into the latent space and just plug it into the reconstruction loss. And that way we just can ignore the background. The second thing is that we want to be more robust to different poses and different viewpoints. So we want to experiment with some perceptual loss. We want to, um, to measure the, the distance between the features of the input images and the features of the generated images. 
So let's say that we have some pre-trained feature structure like VGG or ResNet. So this is the loss that we imagine. But for this loss to be implicable, we need to, um, to understand what is the generated image. But as Tomer said, at each step of the optimization, we have some latent noisy, uh, we have some noisy latent ZT at time step T, and we need to get some estimation of the generated images uh, based on the, uh, those this, that, this time steps. So how are we going to do that? So the basic equation of the latent um, diffusion model is that we have some noisy latent ZT at time step T, and this is a linear combination of the clean latent Z0, which is the result of the, the encoder um, to the latent space, and Gaussian noise. And the unit, the denoiser that we, that we train, gets the noisy latent ZT and the time step T and predicts this Gaussian noise. So if we have the noisy latent and the prediction of the noise, we can subtract the noise from the noisy latent and predict the clean latent Z0. Then we can plug it to the decoder of the VAE and get an estimation of the RGB image that we're going to generate. And then we can plug this generated image into the feature extractor, into the feature extractor and calculate the loss uh, in the feature space. And hopefully we'll be more robust to different poses and to different viewpoints uh, because um, this is the common result in feature space applications. Now, the last thing is how we can keep the optimized embeddings in the value distribution. So for that end, we want to add some regularization term, and we want to learn some prior that will tell us what valid embedding is. And for that, we're going to use some parametric model P. It will be very, very simple one. We're thinking about some isotropic Gaussian, maybe mixture of Gaussian. And very much inspired by GANs, we will train it with positive and negative examples of embeddings, of valid em embeddings. So our uh, encoder is clip in stable diffusion, and it is shared uh, for images and text. So for positive examples, we will use the input images and the prompt templates that Tomer showed before with the initialization work. And we will encode them and use them as positive examples. And for negative examples, we will use this. You hear me now? Now, yes. Okay, so um, where did you stop hearing me? One sentence. Okay, so I'll just uh, start uh, again. We will use um, positive and negative examples to train this parametric model. So we're going to use the input images and the prompt templates that, Tom that Tomer showed before as positive examples and destructive augmentations of the images and the prompts as negative embeddings examples. So we can use blurring, masking, swapping words in the sentences. And we want to get high probability for the valid embeddings and low probability for the negative examples, the bad uh, augmentation that we will create. Then once we have that prior, we can just plug it into the uh, optimization loss as a regularization term. And we hope that it will help us to keep the optimized results uh, in the valid distribution, even if we add more and more images, uh, that might be very helpful if our context or the concept is very complicated. Uh, so that's it. If you have any questions, we would be happy to answer. And we also have some references here, both for the core papers we used in the presentation and some more papers about personalization. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Did you mention which paper is this? Who are the authors and uh, when was it published? Um, so I didn't mention the authors. Um, this is uh, the paper and image is worth one word. Um, is it the paper from uh, Danny Coeno? Yes. Okay. It's so, by Renaud Gall and Daniel Coeno. Okay, we should be proud of it. It's an Israeli paper. Yeah, this yes. is a very impressive paper from them. Questions? I have a small question. Um, when when you uh, 
when you find the best embedding, you're restricted to a certain embedding size. Maybe some concepts need more uh, representation. Did the authors or you think about this concept and how to tackle it? So, um, you know, that's a great question because not only we are restricted to specific size of embeddings, we are also restricted to one token because we only yes. uh, optimize one token. And there are a few uh, like recent experiments of these authors actually that they're trying to optimize multiple tokens for the same concept. And they see that when we have very, very complicated object or concepts, one token is not enough. But when we're trying to optimize many uh, tokens, then we get much better reconstruction and we can learn better the, the, the concept. So we didn't think about um, increasing the size of the embedding because eventually- No, that, this is what I meant, multiple tokens. Uh, yeah, so, so, so you're definitely saying... it happens and we're thinking about it and we will probably even talk with the authors and the, the group of Daniel to see what they're doing there. Right. Okay, Betty, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth, and I will present the paper BBDM Image to Image Translation with Brownian Bridge Diffusion Models. Uh, this paper was presented in CVPR 2023. And let's move on. Uh, we'll talk about the problem definition, then we'll go to the background that is relevant. Uh, we'll talk about the methodology of this paper. We'll compare uh, their model to condition diffusion models. Uh, we'll see the experiments they did and the conclusions. So the problem here is image to image translation. Uh, it's a common uh, problem in computer vision and it's mapping between uh, two image domains. Uh, they focused, uh, they, their focus was on style transfer, semantic image synthesis, and sketch to photo. As we see here, um, we have the input image, and uh, we'll get, uh, I'll focus, wait, I want to add a laser point. Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I will focus mainly on the, on the middle problem so that we will get in the inference time uh, the mask and um, we want to get a generated realistic image. So uh, let's dive to the background of uh, the models we have until this paper. We have GANs with paired data, like uh, pix to pix We have GANs with unpaired data that trained uh, to solve those problems like cycle GANs. And um, the, in the last uh, years, in the last uh, two years, we have DDPM also with conditions. And I will explain about it later in the comparison. And what is a Brownian bridge? A Brownian bridge is a stochastic process um, that as we see, the distribution relies on the initial state and the final state. And the distribution is Gaussian. We see that the mean is a linear combination of the initial state and the final state. And we notice that the variance is a closed expression. So we won't talk about it a lot. I, I will say a few words about it. So as you see here, uh, you have two points, uh, the start point and the end point. And each of them uh, is from uh, the, dis the distribution that is Gaussian, and you see the variance here is zero because it's deterministic, the start point and the end point. We know both of them. Each way between them uh, can be if each state is with this distri distribution. Uh, we we'll talk about it more um, about the model, how it connects to to diffusion models and the BBDM. Let's go to the methodology. Um, I will talk about the whole model, but most of the lecture, I will explain the main innovation here. Um, 
we, we see here the VQ GAN, we see the encoder and decoder because they work in the latent space. And the Bronian bridge is uh, the main innovation here um, that they added with the diffusion process. And we see the same diffusion process uh, that we have in, in DDPM. Ah, small notice here that I will talk about X and Y. And uh, it means that I talk about the latent uh, embedding. I I'm not talking about the, the picture itself, but the latent representation here. Uh, so in the forward process in the DDPM, uh, we get an image and then we, with, with each step, we're noising it more and more and more until we get a pure noise image. Uh, in the BBDM, it's a slight different process because the end, the, the end state, the final state is the mask, is the other domain. So we have uh, the first domain of our image that we started with and um, the final domain, the mask. And as you see here, we have the distribution of the Browning bridge and you see it's Gaussian, the same as we saw before. And it relies uh, on the initial and the final state. Um, a few words about uh, the variance here. Uh, in the original Brownian bridge, we see the variance uh, co includes uh, T, uh, the number of steps that we have in our process. It's a problem for us because in the middle of the process, we'll have a very big variance. It will increase uh, with the number of steps in our diffusion process. And this, is, uh, this way is untrainable for us. So in the paper, they came, they relied on the assumption the variance in the middle steps should preserve to be identity, as we saw in the DDPM. And they chose this expression for uh, the variance. And uh, we see that in the middle of the way, in the middle of the process, they really get the, the identity. So uh, this is the variance will fall will be with us within this uh, in this paper. Uh, I won't talk about it anymore because it, it's not the main idea here. So the forward process, as we saw, relies on the initial and the final state. And it could be a problem for us uh, when we talk about the inference, for example. Uh, but now we get only the marginal distribution at each step. And we want to rely on the previous step. So a bit of algebra here, and we will uh, write the expression for xt and the state, the previous state xt minus one will substitute the x zero. And we see that we got the distribution for xt by the previous state and the final state. And we see that it's a Gaussian also. Um, with with this term, it's very with with those coefficients. If you want to see the algebra behind it, uh, you can go look in the paper. So this was the forward process. Now I'll go to the reverse process. So in DDPM, we have the pure noise image, and we clean it in each state until we get to the generated image in the end. In the BBDM, as I said before. We'll start with the mask here. We won't start with with a noisy image, and from here we will try to go in, in each step to a, at the end the other domain. We'll, we will move a bit, and here we can see a generated sample from the domain that we wanted, the realistic image. And um, it's important to say that while training we have x0, so we have the, the real image, we have the ground truth, uh, but here you can see the difference for with for the same mass. Uh, it's very interesting and a different way to look at it from, from the way we learn about DDPMs. So 
and we we learn the distribution here we are in the reverse process and we have the state the next state like the the t minus 1 and it depends only on t and y and we can see it's a gaussian uh, with the mean that we will predicted value mean that we want to learn and the close expression for the variance and I want to explain to you the way I'll come back here. Uh, I want to explain to you how they came to this idea. So we will dive into the details now. And they optimize the process with elbow. And we see here a very uh, big expression, very large expression here. I want to simplify it a bit. We have here the first step. Uh, of the reversed uh, process. Here we can see all the steps in the middle of the process and the last step that uh, we do to get the generated image. Uh, we won't talk about uh, the last and the first terms because they not really rely on uh, the distribution of Brownian bridge and the learned distribution. So we will focus on this term. And as you see, uh, we have here a divergent of pullback library between uh, the distribution of Browning bridge and the learned distribution. We will try to fit those distributions and uh, from this get our uh, estimator. Now, when we look at the uh, distribution of Browning bridge, we see uh, with ba with base and Markov, we we can get an expression for, for this distribution because we we didn't get any any expression for it until now. We can see that with the Brownian bridge, uh, we know the fine the initial and the final states, so we can cal we can calculate we can know the distribution of this term. We can know the distribution of the dem uh, de denominator. And this distribution, if, if you remember, uh, we already talked about in the forward process. Uh, each of them is a Gaussian. So we're multiplying and dividing here Gaussians, and we get a Gaussian. And we see that we have an expression that we'll, we will see in the next slide for the mean and uh, the variance. That is a close expression, as I, as I said before. So this is a Gaussian. and. I think it's a very, very uh, natural. Uh, natural, yes, very natural assumption that this distribution will be also a Gaussian uh, with learned uh, mean here and the same variance because the variance uh, only applies from uh, the state, the states that we have. Uh, through the training and through the inference. So um, we'll see now the expression for the mean. And as you see here, we have xt, x0, the initial state and the final state with reparameterization and some algebra. And uh, we can see that we have a coefficient for xt, y. We have here also noise, uh, epsilon, and that is a, with normal distribution. And uh, we have x0. It's a bit of a problem because in the inference, we don't have x0, we want to get it. So in inference, we will learn this noise. Oh, the whole expression here is learned. Um, and this will be our noise estimator. So, if we simplify the expressions we saw before, uh, we can see that the predicted mean value uh, will look like this. We have xt because it was the uh, previous state in the reverse process. We have y, it was uh, the mass that, that we had in the beginning. And um, now we will learn the noise. And if we look at the elbow expression later, we will see that uh, we will try to fit the expression we saw before with 
this noise, with this noise estimator. So let's look at the training algorithm. It's very interesting because it's very different from the DDPM uh, we saw in class. Uh, we get a pair of images with, uh, from, from mask, like one of the images are the mask and one is the realistic one. And we pick a timestamp uh, uniformly and we add a Gaussian noise. Uh, let's say we have uh, those two uh, images. Then we have the forward diffusion that is very different from the DDPM because we rely here only on the initial and the final state. We don't rely here on the previous step. So it's very interesting. We don't need to do all, all the way to, to calculate xt. And from here, uh, in row six, we train our estimator that gets uh, the timestamp and xt and uh, learns the, the noise here, learns uh, the noise that are, in my opinion, as I see it, the difference between uh, one domain and the other domain, and maybe with some noise uh, to avoid overfit. The inference algorithm, it's, it's still the same as, as we saw in the DDPM. Um, the, the expression here is different, but uh, a bit, but we have uh, the mask image instead of a noise one. Uh, this is also a, a big difference from the DDPM. And uh, we use the trained estimator. We give him the timestamp, uh, the state that we're in, and we get uh, the noise estimator here. And this is the way uh, we propagate until we get to uh, the, sampled, the sample that the model generates. So do you have questions for this part? Or, or it's okay. Okay, uh, so I'll continue. Um, here I compare uh, the BBDM with conditional diffusion models. And uh, we already saw today uh, the LDM, the latent diffusion model that has a regular diffusion model and we add the conditions here. In each step, we inject uh, the, the image that we have. Uh, let's say we have the mask. So here, it's like we'll inject the mask in, in each state until we'll get uh, the generated image. So the first one that we see here, the first model is uh, the LDM, the condition diffusion model. And the model uh, above, uh, below is the model that uh, they present in the paper. So as I see it, it's, uh, whole new model uh, that starts in one domain and ends in a different one without any condition and without the noise image that, that we need here to start the reverse process. The experiments they did, uh, they relay, relied on um, three, four data sets and they had three main experiments uh, style transfer, sketch to photo, and the sem semantic synthetic that we already talked about. The metrics are FID, as we learned in class, uh, LPIPS, it's a perceptional image patch similarity, and it uh, matches human perception well, as, as they say in their paper, and the diversity. The, diver the, gener the diverse data set that uh, the model generates. So we would like a lower FID, a lower LPIPs, and a higher diversity. And let's look only on the bold values. And as we see, the BBDM is pretty competitive in the FID and the, and the LPIPs in, in all the tasks. In the diversity, there are uh, other models that are slightly better. And if we look, uh, if if we look at the on the results uh, with human eye, we can see that in these samples and in this task, uh, we see a pretty good generation that generating of, of this realistic image. Uh, we see here uh, families of uh, different models, 
those are conditional diffusion models. Uh, here we have a conditional guns or non-conditional, it's, it's gun models. And here we have a more convolutional also methods. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the results are pretty impressive and very realistic. And we can see in the, the diversity that we have a pretty good diversity here uh, from the model for this mask. It's, it's not re very realistic, but it, it looks good. And more, uh, more comparison, we can see that it's pretty competitive uh, to, to the other models here. And the main conclusion, uh, in my opinion, is that this is a whole new method for image-to-image -image translation by using Brownian bridge without conditions. We can see that the results are pretty competitive. They had more experiments in the paper, but I covered only the main idea. Um, that the main idea I think is uh, pretty uh, innovative here. And um, they also show uh, the acceleration of the inference, they change scale of the variance, and they use a latent space in different dimensions. And I really cannot determine which method is better, better, but it's a whole new method. So I think this is the interesting part here. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Questions? You showed us a few samples from uh, your paper. Where I like, showed you a few samples from the. And I, I mean, you showed us that the model can output a few few samples for the ah, same yeah. uh, Y. Uh, how yeah. come? Like, where do you you add noise to get a uh, various samples? Okay, so I will go to the inference algorithm. Wait. Here. We can see here the Z. So, oh, okay, got it. As I understand it, uh, it's for the diversity. Oh, cool, thanks. Other questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, if you were to, um, instead of using Wise, which is like a mask or something, just uh, use random Gaussian noise, would you go back to DDPM algorithm or something similar? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, wait, I want to look at the distribution here. If we look on the Brownian bridge, mm -hmm. I think I think that maybe we could. Okay, you don't have to get. I'm not. It, it's I'm not, a good question. It's a good question. Okay. To think Might be interesting it. to think about it. Yeah. But as I see it, uh, you, you can rely on, uh, you can rely on your final state, and you can rely on your previous state. So, <laughs> I, I think that that you can. But it's uh, okay. Interesting to think about it more uh, deeply. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording here.